withstand very high accelerations. Uh, that's one of the reasons we're doing that testing next week, is to find out if that can actually work. So we'll learn if it can land on the moon, perhaps, through those tests. We'll also learn if it can accelerate super fast and get launched that way. If you could do that, imagine putting one of these light gas guns anywhere you like. Where would you like to put one of these? Uh, maybe Dryden would be a good place? Okay. Where else? Maybe on an airplane? Okay. Um, maybe on the space station? Maybe on the moon? Where else would you put one? Actually, I was just about to say the moon to launch for yeah. planets and maybe fly by. So I think it was Robert Heinlein, the science fiction author, maybe it was Arthur C. Clarke, who said, once you're in low Earth orbit, you're halfway to anywhere, which means that the energy necessary to get into low Earth orbit is about half what you need to escape the Earth entirely. Mm -hmm. So if you can get all the way to Earth orbit just by some other means, let's say get to the space station, launch from there, uh, you can go to asteroids, well past the moon, maybe even make it to Mars. So that's a project in the future. We'll see what happens. What I like about uh, thinking about these things is they're not completely wacky. You can, in fact, build this hardware. It is possible to do this and to do it really cheaply, which means we might all be able to participate in that kind of activity at some point. So let me wrap up with this uh, little story here. One of the exciting features of these very small spacecraft is they don't take much energy to get moving quickly. So I mentioned the light gas gun as an example of one way to get these things moving past Earth orbit. Uh, so they don't propel themselves, but maybe something else could propel them. Interstellar flight is one of those clearly science fiction topics, right? By interstellar, we mean somewhere between here and another star. The farthest any human-made spacecraft has ever gone is just at the ragged edge of the solar system. It's called the heliopause. It's where the pressure from the sun meets that stuff that surrounds the uh, solar system. What would it take to get something beyond that in a reasonable amount of time? In fact, we found out that uh, Proxima Centauri, which is the closest star to Earth, it's a red dwarf, it's barely visible, uh, has orbiting around it a planet which is roughly Earth's size. In fact, it's also close enough, but not too close, to Proxima Centauri to be in the so-called habitable zone. That is, the temperature's about right. Isn't it convenient that the closest star to Earth also has a planet that might be habitable, or at least it looks like it's in the right zone? I think that's a fascinating opportunity. If ever we were to send a spacecraft to another star, it's probably to that one, at least in the near future. But any spacecraft we could conceive of, like the space shuttle or, uh, you know, name your, your favorite uh, NASA probe, Juno, or something else like this, would take thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of years to reach Proxima Centauri, and I'm not that patient. Probably you're not either. So how can we get something to go faster? Well, start with something small. So that's what I wanted to talk about here. One of the applications for sending these little guys to outer <coughs> space is uh, to go as far as possible. Why would you do this? Why would you bother sending a <coughs> spacecraft to Proxima Centauri? Well, there is that exoplanet, that tantalizingly, maybe, Earth-like planet only 4.3 light years away. I say only, but that's, that's hard to reach there, but maybe, maybe. Um, also, if you can't get there, if you can only maybe do a hundredth of that, you can still do some extraordinary things. You can get to the moon in a few seconds, Mars in an hour, the heliopause, which is where Voyager and Pioneer roughly are at the moment, uh, those were spacecraft launched in the 70s, you can get there in three days. And here's another cool thing you could do. Uh, you may remember that uh, the presence of very heavy bodies like the sun, uh, that warps space-time. In fact, it warps the path of light traveling past these heavy bodies. So if you look at the sun from far away, and don't, you know, mind yourself, if you look at the sun from far away, light coming from behind the sun goes around it and then tucks in like a lens. It's called gravitational lensing. If you look at the sun, you could in fact treat the sun as a kind of telescope so that some object far away would be magnified in size many millions of times. If you could put a spacecraft far enough away, it's about 550 times as far from the sun as the Earth is. If you could put it there, you would be able to see very far into the distant universe uh, to the point where if you actually were lucky enough to have an exoplanet, traveling right there at the right time, which you probably wouldn't, but if you did have that, you could see features on the surface of that planet. 
there are many reasons to want to explore going fast and far that aren't just because it would be interesting. Uh, there's some amazing science to be done. But why else? Well, because it's there. Um, George Mallory met kind of a sticky end, but he was an advocate of exploring because, you know, that's what we do. That's what we do as humans. Here's one reason why this is hard. It's kind of a weird picture, but imagine a logarithmic scale of distance here, starting from the sun. Uh, you can't see the numbers here, but don't worry about it. As you go farther and farther away, I'm compressing space by orders of magnitude. So the sun, uh, the orbits of uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and so forth. Here's the asteroid belt. The planets, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and so forth, get compressed into little lines. It is so far between points where you get any light to do anything with that you either have to store up all the energy you want at the very beginning uh, or come up with some technology we don't know. But there is maybe a way to send something very far from our orbit and get it where we want it to go. And it's called the Breakthrough Starshot Project. This is a project where uh, I'm an advisor. There's a number of other folks from Cornell who are advisors. There's a billionaire in California who wants to send one of these little uh, sprites to a distant star. His plan is, roughly 20 years from now, he expects the cost of lasers to be low enough that you could shine laser light onto a sprite, accelerate it at about 60,000 times the force due to gravity, do so for about two minutes, and this little chip would reach about 20% the speed of light. <laughs> now remember that the speed of light is the speed limit of the universe, right? There is nothing that we know that goes faster than light. Getting to 20% of that speed requires a ridiculous amount of energy. That's why 50 gigawatts of laser power shining on this thing. And before you get excited, yes, there's lots of hard things to solve here. But if you could do that, uh, this is about the only way to get something to Proxima Centauri in a human lifetime. At 20% of the speed of light, it takes about 21 years of time as reckoned by us on Earth. Interestingly, because of relativity, uh, time passes more slowly on our sprite, and it would experience only 20 years for the voyage. And that's kind of a neat little feature. What's your question? So the, this would be very slow, but since space has barely any friction at all, wouldn't you be able to just cut out, just store all of the power for later and let it drift through the dead zone? Yeah, that's exactly what you do. That's exactly the plan. So uh, for the first few <coughs> minutes, in fact, it's just about two minutes, it accelerates like mad, and then everything turns off, and for 20 years or more, it just coasts, does absolutely nothing. And then when it arrives or gets close to proximity, things turn on again. It takes maybe one picture and answers a difficult question with a few bits of data. Because with as small as these are, even if you had the sunlight of Proxima B to help you send the data back, you're not going to be able to send a whole lot of data. But it does seem to be possible. It, does, uh, it is physically possible, mathematically possible, to send a few bits from Proxima B using a one watt laser. That's why there's a little tiny laser on board that chip. Because maybe we could send a little bit of data back. If you could send one bit from a distant star, what would it be? It's a good question to ask yourself. I think one. it's the answer to a complicated question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So think about that. <laughs> as crazy as this sounds, it's this kind of technology that makes it possible. And it's thanks to technologies outside of aerospace. It's thanks to, once again, commercial off-the-shelf electronics. Uh, the ability that we now have to make electronics so incredibly cheap that we can make any level of sophistication we probably would want um, to fit on something as small as what I just handed out to you. So I won't go through the details here, but there's a processor, a little laser diode, some cameras, uh, and lots of other cool stuff that uh, actually live on that chip. If that were possible 20 years from now, it would reach Proxima Centauri 20 years thence, which means Someone like you, this thing is going to be about 52 or so. And uh, at that point, you can tell your kids that you were here when uh, you heard about this idea. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, I think it would take 20 years for the day to get back. Right? It, it's, uh, it takes 4.3 four years for the day to get back. Yeah, 4.3. <laughs> Maybe I got your name, age wrong, I'm not sure. But, right, so at light speed, 4.3 light years and 4.3 years. Anyway, that's one of the ideas we have for this thing. Uh, and as exciting as that is, let me bring us back to, uh, to Earth here. Uh, I like the idea that this kind of technology levels the playing field and allows us all to dream big the way that probably in decades past it was only rich people or maybe folks who were 
working for NASA who could hope to participate in this kind of thing. I'm telling you, we can all do it now. And uh, again, that's, I think that's an exciting time to live in. Um, I have some other little gifts up here for people who are interested. Uh, it has nothing to do with the talk, but if you want to actually build a spacecraft of your own cardboard, uh, this is the Orion Crew Capsule. It's the human space uh, capsule that will be launching possibly in 2020. We'll see. Um, and you can put it together yourself. So if you'd like one of these for you or your younger sibling or whatever, go ahead and pick one of those up. Any other questions I can answer before we go? Yes? What would you think about a space elevator? Okay, so could, could you explain that for everybody if you want to? Well, a space elevator would be a counterweight in, in space that would hold up a tether connected to the Earth to a buried anchor. And then there would be a climber that would climb the wire up to a space station on the top of the elevator. Yeah, so it's it, another uh, fascinating idea that came from Arthur C. Clarke, the science fiction author who also gave us the geosynchronous satellite, among other things. So the idea is exactly that. It's a, it's a cable or something that goes from Earth all the way up to space, like Jack and the Beanstalk, but without the beans. <laughs> and the idea is, with a counterweight far enough away, it stretches out this cable, provides some tension. The problem is that there is no material strong enough that we know of that can withstand the weight of the cable itself. The tension is not the problem. It's the, it, as due to the centripetal whatever, it's the, it's the weight of that cable that has to be something like 50,000 kilometers long. It would, have to, it would wrap around the Earth several times to be that long. Uh, neglecting any safety issues or anything else. If you were to build it out of some material, though, like uh, if you could find a special type of carbon called a carbon nanotube, yeah. it doesn't quite work, but if, if it did work, you'd have to have continuous carbon nanotubes making a roughly one kilometer thick base. So we're talking about something the size of Dryden, thick, going up, necking up to a cable somewhere on Earth. I would say that that's very expensive. It's probably cheaper to send up rockets. Um, but that doesn't mean the idea is completely out of whack. Uh, a Canadian company about a year and a half ago patented a, another version of a space elevator you might look up. Rather than making a solid piece of material whose own weight has to support it, they proposed a hollow inflated tube. And when you inflate that tube, the pressure, the internal pressure, actually counteracts the tension. And you end up balancing those forces and you have a much, much lighter tether. So they have in mind to launch little aircraft off the top of it um, that maybe is a good idea, I don't know, but it actually could work in principle for something like that. The best version of a space elevator I've seen, though, is one that would be on one of the moons of Mars. There's Phobos and Deimos, fear and hatred, uh, moons of Mars. Uh, if you put one of these things there, it would be much easier to land on the moon of Mars and travel down that cable and sort of jump off a few kilometers from the surface and maybe coast with an aircraft. aircraft. Uh, rather than doing all the entry, descent, and landing stuff we're used to. Uh, once again, this requires a huge investment in infrastructure, so you better be going for more than just one trip. But one of the things that you could be thinking about when you're in charge of NASA is what are the investments we should be making now to enable that kind of future? We tend to think a little short term. We tend to think, here's a cool science question, let's go answer that. Or let's go to Mars, let's go to the moon. And instead, maybe we should be thinking about things like building infrastructure for space. How do we build an interplanetary highway, so to speak? How would we do communications reliably throughout space? Internet nodes across the planets, for example. Or maybe landing strips on the moon. So you wouldn't need rockets, you just land with wheels. Um, there'd be a lot of things that you could invest in that aren't quite as sexy as uh, new space science, but still uh, could make the future come to the present faster. So think about that as a trade-off. Um, I don't want to exceed my welcome here, so I've got one more quick question, and then we'll call it quits. <coughs> okay. Yes? You mentioned earlier how you could modify the sprites so that they would survive the entry. Yes. Uh, would that cost without the state? Yeah. They're very, very inexpensive. So the current generation is about four grams, and it's uh, uh, like an inch and a half by inch and a half. So, the next version would be a little bigger and much thinner. Rather than printing it on this fiberglass material, it's called FR4 circuit board material, we would, uh, we would put the circuitry on Kapton, which is a thin plastic. Right there, that saves most of the weight. But we're also adding some more stuff. We're replacing these fairly uh, heavy glass solar cells with thin film <coughs> solar cells. 
uh, the company that makes them makes the Fitbit solar cells, if you've got one of those things, um, that saves some weight. But we're adding some weight back in in the form of a GPS receiver. So right now, the only way we know where this thing is is if it goes overhead and we hear a beep, it must be somewhere up there. That's not very precise. The GPS chip would actually tell us a lot more. So that's the next generation, we think. Um, I, I wanted to show you, I'll leave you with this though. Here's the site you can go to if you are particularly motivated to build your own one of these. We've had a number of people around the world uh, build these sprites. There's a GitHub site. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but raise your hand if you've heard of GitHub before. It's kind of a software sharing kind of site. Uh, slash kicksat, and you can download all plans to learn anything you want. It is all free of export uh, laws and so forth. Everything's commercially available. You can just build it no matter who you are. Uh, if you really want to, we have some kits that are pre-assembled, and there's also little uh, wires and cables and whatnot to plug it into your computer. So you could email me, and I can get you one, but I would still have to ask you for a little bit of money, because it does cost us someone to put these together. Still, for buying spacecraft for 100 bucks or so, it's not too bad. Yes, one more question. Did you go to directly to the uh, electromagnetic <coughs> torque coil idea for uh, attitude control, or did you try a gyroscope? Oh, that's a great question. So let me say we considered all the possibilities. Uh, but you know, something mechanical is just going to be pretty heavy, right? right? So it really came down to weight. And the, the, whole, the goal, I should say, <laughs> the original plan for these sprites was never to be a cheap, small CubeSat, uh, which is kind of what it is. Um, instead, it was meant to demonstrate some space physics. We were going to see what happens when you drop these in the ionosphere. It's kind of a long and boring science story. Uh, but it turned out the platform itself was so exciting for people that we just said, okay, well, we'll just focus on that then. So the original plan required that it be as lightweight as possible. So we had to reject reaction wheels or all sorts of other interesting gizmos. I, you're right, that is a way to go. You could do it that way. Keep in mind, though, that if you're going for flat, which we're trying to do because we want it to act like a parachute, uh, you can't put a wheel in those other two axes. You can only put one in the plane. With a magnetic torquer, you can get torque in two directions. It's perpendicular to the magnetic field, wherever that is. So you get, you get two uh, degrees of freedom of torque, which is better than the wheel. A single wheel could get you. So there is some advantage there, but you're absolutely right. That's another way to go. Well, listen, I think time's about up. Thank you so much for your interest. And uh, grab a, an Orion cardboard model if you'd like. And a survey. Official NASA stickers. There. Grab a survey, grab a sticker, and you get it. Those look surprisingly cool. It's also kind of